this week on the Back Table Podcast. You have to decide that this is something you're going to want to do. And then you just have to make it happen at all costs. It's very easy. You need a tech, you need a brain, and you need a hand, and you need a machine and a foot. Five things. You don't even need a sterile environment. And you also need a no whining. You just have to get it done. Now, if your administration won't support it, then you can't do it. You can push and push and push, and it's going to take between one and like four years to have ultrasound up to what you want. So here's my answer to that. The doctors need to get their hands on the probe and just start looking. Just start doing it yourself. That's what happens. I mean, to Miguel's point, this is what's happening in other countries. And I love the international community because they're not, it's a no excuses type community. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. For more than a decade, Reflow Medical has designed and engineered medical devices that respond to unmet clinical needs. The Wingman Crossing Catheter with its unique extendable beveled tip and an expanded indication for CTOs. The Specs LP, created to meet the need for a low-profile version of the Specs shapeable support catheter, and the new line of core catheters that answers the call for a suite of effective tools to use in challenging PCI procedures. Together, we can save more limbs and help more people walk without pain. Boston Scientific is committed to advancing science in the fight against PAD by boldly innovating with next-generation drug-looting technology. Backed by level one randomized control trials, Their proven technology delivers exceptional results no matter the patient, no matter the lesion. Choose Boston Scientific, Drug Illusion, and take the fight to PAD. Visit bostonscientific.com or see the show notes to learn more. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast. I am your host, Jill Somerset. Thank you all for tuning in. I have the pleasure to be here today with the world-renowned vascular surgeon and interventional radiologist, Dr. Miguel Montero-Baker and Dr. Mary Constantino. And I'm so excited. This is really the conclusion of a multi-series podcast that we all developed together to really highlight and discuss the need for advanced ultrasound, specifically talking about arterial duplex, but we also had a podcast with Dr. Kathy Gibson. And so I'm very excited about this series Dr. Constantino and I obviously work together and we've done many podcasts together and I love it because she really, there's no fluff here. She tells it exactly how it is. And you definitely walk the walk and talk the talk. This woman multitasks trillion things every day and I get the pleasure to listen to her in clinic while I scan a patient. She does a phenomenal job educating the patient, discussing all of the benefits and risks. And she really provides stellar care in her outpatient-based cath lab. And oftentimes, we don't even talk during the day. It's usually a nod, a giggle, or it's understood what each other's thinking. So it's, it's pretty great. I think yesterday or the other day, you were like, I don't know what's wrong with me because every time I turned a corner, Jill started cracking up. (laughs) It's just like, I just feel like I have the giggles today. But we actually don't actually need to say any words to each other. We nod, yes, no, we're so in sync because our ultrasound interventional versus surgical clinical pool is so perfectly pristine and clean. Like we just are so in line with what we're doing. And the crazy part is it's not that hard to be in line. You just have have people who care. And people act like it's like some huge thing you got to learn or do. It's not. It's like working with a surgical tech. I mean, I'm not a surgeon. Miguel, maybe you have something to say about that. But I mean, I know I have a scrub tech and you get on this on this wave and you probably are with surgical techs, but you, we should have that with our ultrasound techs too. Like you you don't need to like explain some long thing to me. Just say ablate, yeah, no, uh, uh, for to Like it's literally muttering stuff and I already know what you're thinking and you know what I'm thinking. I feel like you and I've had this three-year history, and Miguel, you and I have had the pleasure to work together down in Mexico, and we're going to develop that really fast. And I, I already see it. You've taught me so much. In fact, our last podcast was awesome. We definitely learned about your your past and your German training, which I love. And my favorite part of that podcast actually was the love sprinkles part, because that's what you do. You like sprinkle the Miguel love of 
all over the world and you connect people. You have this amazing way to just find people with like-minded, passionate, like souls. So I, I'm so happy that I get to work with you. And I, I really look forward to having that same language. I know we're going to have it because you too, if we ever scrub together, we don't even need to say a word. I think we all know. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> no, it is. Um, it's really not that hard. And, I, you know, you keep pointing it out. And sometimes I try to be mindful about why it is that that potentially happens. And all I can say is I have a very low bar. I have a no asshole rule. If you really commit to it, you realize that there's so many great people out there and it's not difficult to be a nice person and it's not difficult to be an empathetic person and to be caring and to understand and to try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And then you start seeing the spark. And it's when that spark comes out that you really, it becomes, it's just like magic. And so love sprinkles in many ways is just finding how to create a bridge for somebody to share that spark. And once you see that spark, then you be, it's addictive because the thing with people like Jill, which by the way, we haven't really counter introduced you into this, but Jill, y- you just, you don't even have to love sprinkle you, right? Like you're like just throwing all that positive energy out there and it becomes addictive to everybody, which coalesces through that energy and it's contagious, right? And so it's that what I think has somehow united us all in, in this, in, in this, in this great journey here of now a few years and that will, I think, continue building some, some great things from it. You know what also unites us is that we don't have to dick around. We are just getting down to business, right? Like we don't have to do random administrative burnout stuff. I'm starting a movement called administrative burnout. We can walk into a room. I can say, here's your diagram. Here's your flow. Here's your number. Do you smoke? Do you have diabetes? It's medicine practice at its finest. And I don't think we're spending any time leading by ego, leading by debate, leading by this thing. We're just like pushing the pushing it on medicine, which makes our job so much more interesting and easy and fun. And we forget that. So it's not necessarily, I think like Miguel said, it's it's not necessarily that there's some mystery to this. It's just you have got to cut out the fat and get down to the medicine because that's the fun part. And then you have a lot of people care because you're not worried about the other stuff. Like you can just get down to it and you can talk medicine and talk science and that's what's the most satisfying. And actually, Jill, you brought that back to for PAD work and to me for sure. And I mean, this is why it's so fun. And I, I think patients, I was, my mammography professor told me, attending and said, you're going to walk in the door and people are going to want to know, is it cancer or is it not? And you can sit around, you can talk about, oh, you have a mass and it's speculated and blah, 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 blah. Patients only are thinking one word, cancer or not cancer. And I feel that way with PAD. You walk in and you just get right to it. You say, here's your foot, here's your toe, and here's your flow. Here's what we can do and here are your options. And they're like very appreciative. Patients understand a lot more than we give them credit for. We don't need to dick around with this softness. Just get to it in a nice way. And then you bond with them. And we're so bonded to our patients. I think it's because they come for answers and they're getting answers with none of this fluffiness and none of this go here and then get this and then follow up. And maybe two months later, we might have an answer for you. That's a medicine problem. That's a medicine systems problem. And I think everybody who does our work should strive to fix that and just dial back from all the junk in healthcare and just just get down to the nitty gritty. One of the things that I love about both of you for what I see from my view is you do this incredible job of a multidisciplinary approach. And, you know, Miguel, you're building the Hope Institute. Can you talk a little bit about how you envision your relationship in a multidisciplinary way with these complex CLTI patients? To give it background, Hope is a center for clinical innovation. And what does that mean? It means after many years of trying to figure out how to work such a complex disease condition as, as this chronic limb threatened ischemia within a complicated hospital and corporate system, I just came to the conclusion that despite many attempts to make that work, it was really hard. You, you couldn't always have the the same people involved. It was hard to align with the administration. And many times, fact of the matter is these patients just require a lot of handholding that becomes apersonal within a big hospital structure. And so 
you have to realize that if you have the opportunity because of a variety of reasons, personal and non-personal, professional, and non-professional, to take a step back and say, how would I do this? How would I rewrite this book if I could? I came to the, to the understanding that, that there's a great way, there's a great message, there's a great story to be built, that these patients are probably better served by a group of people that understand it, that work cohesively, that are willing to cross-pollinate, and that understand that at the center of the matter, it's the patient's care, that we're going to bring diagnoses, adequate diagnoses, multifaceted diagnoses, trying to get the best of all kinds, add research, add education, and then execution. But that, that execution doesn't really end with just a procedural-based execution. It's the execution of a care continuum. It has to do with the management of nutrition, the management of, I mean, orthotics, wound care. The, the amount of people that need to be involved are so big, but there is an opportunity and, and here I'm going to go a little bit out on a limb here and say that I, I envision as part of this dream to potentially remove fee for service. And I know that that's a little bit audacious, but imagine if the world were where we get adequately compensated for doing what, what the patient needs. And it doesn't really matter how many procedures you do because maybe that patient only what he needs is a change of orthotics and maybe a nail procedure. And you don't have to do you know, with an adequate, for example, pedal acceleration time, even in the setting of some PAD, that patient doesn't need an exuberant intervention or a multi-level angioplasty. They need the right set of shoes set and a good wound care and potentially emphasis on her, on their hemoglobin A1C. So I really think that in the setting of this evolving concept of risk-based care or value-based care, there is a huge opportunity for us to do this. And it comes at a time, and I'm sorry for the monologue, but you just said it as an open question, but it comes at a time where a lot of these codes in cardiovascular care are going outpatient. It's creating a gravitational pool to try to coalesce all these random diagnoses and care things and push them into the ambulatory surgery center because now electrophysiology and cardiology have procedural codes. And somehow we're minimizing the office-based lab codes to try to move all these patients there because in the grand scheme, it probably makes sense. But when you look at how complex the CLTI patient care base is, it shouldn't be dragged into the ASC, not necessarily. It, 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 it requires so many other levels of care that I truly think the Hope Innovation or Clinical Innovation Center is going to help lead the way in creating value-based care models in working with, for example, kidney care models that are already placed in the system for Medicare that'll allow us to protect office-based care of multidisciplinary care of these patients that need so much help that shouldn't be just sucked into a change in the codes of, of for example, cardiology and, and, and so other. Not that cardiologists can't care for this. Of course they can. I'm just saying they shouldn't necessarily just bulk it into this other whole compendium of care or side of service just because it needs. So back to the basics, back to creating sensical care, back to knowing patients by their first name, understanding their family members, their dynamics, and potentially even something as, as crazy as maybe doing house calls. I know that's crazy, but what if we could send somebody that could do basic hygiene care of, of foot in, in the house? I mean, how many hospitals would you decongest with analog? So that's what hope is. And we're hoping that hope will become that thing. And, and we've been working very hard for the last four months and looking forward to a very successful, clinically successful entity next year. I think it's pretty exciting. You're ahead of the curve. I mean, your vision is going to be incredible. Dr. Constantino, what do you think about you do such a great job of you call patients, you send sometimes patients home with Uber Eats for dinner after their procedure. I, I mean, you you also to, you know, humanize the experience. And, and I think that's, you know, bringing it back to amazing care. Well, I'm a no drama type of individual. I just want to get stuff done. I want to come to work. I want to do my job. I want you to make it through procedures. I want you to walk out the door. I want you to feel better. I'm a very simple individual. I also, I don't know, I take care of kids. I take care of people. It's my nature. You're hungry. I'll feed you. Maybe it's the Italian in me. But I just had this idea. One day there was a fibroid patient sitting there and her husband was sitting in the, in the little chair waiting for her. And she 
I don't know, it came to be around noon. And it's not like I ever eat. Nobody's concerned if I have anything to eat. But who cares about that? I was like, well, you must be hungry. Okay, well, there's nothing around our center. We have Uber Eats. Why not? Do I care if my center is going to pay $15 for some turkey sandwich for some like dude that's hungry? Zero. I care zero. I care so little about that that I want it to happen without me even knowing. And I've told my staff they know somebody needs something, just get it for them. Like, I don't understand why we have to all be so freaking concerned about everything. My staff is so funny. They, one day my nurse, we had this really grouchy patient. And I, we love, I love grouchy people because I'm kind of a grouchy person myself. And no, she wanted this vanilla milkshake. She would not stop talking about this vanilla milkshake. Well, I come out of the procedure, there's a vanilla milkshake there. And I'm like, awesome. Who ordered me a vanilla milkshake? No, I always, I never assume any of this stuff is for me. And my nurse got on her Uber Eats and ordered this patient a milkshake afterwards. And the thing is, that's not unusual around here. Like, it's just like, hey, lady, your life is rough. Life is rough for these people. They live, you know, rural, a lot of rural areas. They don't have a lot of money. They've got foot wounds. Their feet hurt. Everyone's just saying, don't smoke, don't do this. And they're sitting around and they're like, why wouldn't I smoke? And I'm like, yeah, I actually kind of understand. If I were your situation, I would just smoke at three packs a day and not even think about it. Okay, but if I'm going to get you through this, and this more comes because if I'm going to put effort into like getting this leg reopened, I need to know what you're going to do with it. And it's not a mandate. It's just like, I'm kind of curious. What are you going to like, let's go golfing? Like, what are you going to do with this stuff? And and so people tell you why they want to live. And then you're like, all right, well, let's then make that happen. And what I love, like, I want to write a coffee book. I love hearing about why people want to be able to walk because it always surprise you. My favorite is like the little lady who wanted her son worked at a fire station and she would walk down to the fire station and she just wanted to be able to walk down and visit him every day, which I obviously resonates with me having teenage sons. Or people's birthday. I had a gal who wheeled into the cath lab at like 72 and wheeled out at 73. Well, you betcha. I sent my staff right out. I'm like, you need to go get this girl a birthday cake. And it's small. Like, who cares? Throw five bucks at it or 20 bucks at it. And people need attention these days. We're so fragmented in every way. And I'm running some like kumbaya summer camp, you know, like we're practicing real medicine, but you stop and just like get to know your patients a little bit. It's so fun. And it takes four seconds because what you offer with ultrasound is you offer a direction that is very specific. And I know within 60 seconds because we have objective data on what I need to do. So I can spend however much time talking to them. I know I'm practicing great medicine and I don't stress about that. And then we can chit chat and we get my favorite dude right now just made us this little leather pouch and he gave my nurse fertility beads, which we find super funny because she has four kids. And, you know, this is it's all just being normal and human. But you can't do that when you work in a system that makes you so stressed that you don't want to go to work, that you're already baseline angry. You have to be baseline not angry. Well, I think it reminds us, whether it's the Hope Institute or, or your center, Dr. Constantino, that every touch matters. And as an ultrasound technologist, I matter. I matter in the care of my patient, my bedside manner, how I talk to them. And like you said, Miguel, we bring out the magic, bring in the people to build a team that really every touch matters along the way for these patients. So the ultrasound tech giving results is obviously a thing for me, which as a radiologist, ultrasound techs are not supposed to be giving results, period, end of story. Well, you educate your ultrasound tech on yourself. And you have somebody who's like-minded, like Jill. And I hesitate with that word educated because Jill's taught me more about ultrasound than I could ever wanted to know. And then you have a team. So by the time the patient's hearing something from me, they already know it because Jill's showing them, showing them the blockage. It's not rocket science. Like she puts the thing on. She's like, look, there's your blockage. And they're like, oh, that's why my toe hurts. Yep. Okay. It's all pipes. Not that hard. Miguel, what do you think of that? Can I give results to your patients? Oh, yes. oh, yeah. Even if he doesn't, just override. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I really, I don't, I put myself in their position, right? Okay, you you all know this because Mary keeps picking at me that my life is going to get upside down, which is probably will, but I haven't have a kid. Well, yes. I, you know, I know a lot about ultrasound and the blood vessels, but when I go to an ultrasound and what I see is this thing growing in there, this beautiful moving thing. I have no idea what they're measuring and seeing everything. And, and every second 
that I'm in that room looking at her, I'm trying to analyze, is she cool with what she's seen? Do, is my baby healthy? What did yeah. she just measure other than like maybe his parts that I hope are huge? Oh, I'm sure they're ginormous. I, they are genetically <laughs> Absolutely, incredibly. And they're like, no, that's a femur. Costa Rican. That's a femur, Miguel. Amazing Costa Rican genetic background. Anyway, and then this person leaves the room and me and my wife are just like, well, wow. What? And then we'll let you know. Now, like, what do you mean you will let me know? Let me know what's going on now. You know, on, as also me being a patient, I've been in, in situations where clearly the person behind driving the ultrasound knows what they're seeing. And I'm not saying that you want them to do the entire medical but they can certainly guide you. They can give you a little bit of an assessment. They can put your mind at ease. Oh, the stent looks beautiful, right? You know, something as simple as, oh, wow, it looks like he put a stent. It looks beautiful, right? I may go a little bit more in depth and tell you a little bit of what the plan is. I mean, you're not talking about what meds you're going to give. You're really being professional about what your part of the pie is. So I do like that. But in all honesty, not everybody is Jill and not everybody is some of our techs also that I've worked with before here or who are amazing. But we do have to then in, at the same time, you want that freedom to express and to converse and to discuss, but may that be an educated freedom, right? You can't just tell somebody with an ultrasound machine to start giving some sort of you know medical insights when they don't know what they're seeing, right? And it happens a lot in the hospital when a patient comes in, maybe we've done a complex arterialization procedure and the report is completely upside down. Not even the interpreting physician who's a radiologist understands what they're seeing in the ultrasound. So trust me, being a doctor doesn't mean that the interpretation is going to go quite well either. So the education behind whoever's doing the ultrasound and then also whoever's interpreting the ultrasound becomes crucial in the message you can actually give the patient. Yeah, I definitely think it, it's within the center and the physician and the tech to be on the same page for that. So speaking of ultrasound, you know, this whole series about advanced ultrasound in whether it be pelvic venous disorder or a lower extremity arterial or whatnot, how can we advance the skill and perhaps look at advanced reimbursement? I know we talked about it in the last podcast, but I really think there's a need to rise up the vascular ultrasound techs. I think a lot of techs that I encounter are inspired. They want to do great work, but we've got to have a setting where we can start to deliver that training. Well, I think there has to be incentives. You know, why do you go into medical school? Why do you add a residency? And then on top of that, two years of fellowship. You have to fall in love with what you're doing, but there's also some incentive to do it, right? So I think on one side, we have to be better at explaining to vascular technologists how beautiful the world of, of vascular care is, how exciting it can be, how welcoming it should be, and how much of a team player you should become. There should be some wealth incentives attached to that, right? I mean, it's hard to convince people to go through extra training, extra understanding, extra effort. If there's really no, at the end, there's no advantage when it comes to potentially their financial well-being and their family's well-being. And that same effort has to be done also on the medical side with understanding the recognition that we're trying to make these people, that we're trying to create these tools, these team members that, that need a, a place, that need a microphone to validate their opinion. And then in that sense, we also then need the support to give them time to be able to do that, right? And so that's where these modifiers, in a way, I mean, we have complexity modifiers already dialed into the system. Why could we not think of some potential modifiers when it comes to complexity of ultrasound care that will allow, you know, extra available minutes that would then help us carve more time? Because it's obviously right, the never ending story is you're asking your tech to do more, but you're asking them to give you a more amazing ultrasound with more detail in less time. You can't construct that, right? It's hard. Yeah, I feel like now's the time for it. 2023 goals is because, you know, between venous arterialization, complicated AV fistula mappings, and I posted something on Twitter, TCAR versus endoarterectomy. We can do more. We can help decrease the amount of unnecessary CTs. Speaking of Twitter, let's talk about our Twitter relationships. Miguel and I met on Twitter. Miguel, or Mary, you and I met uh, at a vascular meeting, but Let's talk about the special place of Twitter where we have met new people around the world and actually become friends. It's like another chapter of the Twitter <laughs> files, right? You know yes. how all this Elon Musk freedom of speech is going on. We're not 
we're leaving on the side all the um, interesting social dynamics behind it. It's deviating some attention from a lot of uh, the wonderful good things that I think Twitter and at least that platform itself stands for. I have never felt more connected to vascular surgery in my entire life. And for that, I'm very appreciative. I was going to say, is that good or bad? Man, I love those pictures. Oh, my God, it's so good. I love seeing these pictures of interdirectomies. And I mean, I'm pro I the aortas and it's so great. There's not really the forum that we we don't learn that. Here's what we learn. Vascular surgery can't push wires and catheters like we do. And now I think that's still up for debate. You know, I think it's very dependent on the person. Everybody's got their skill set. I think that there are really there are bad. I I mean, think about it that we're radiologists. So this is not to say there's a specialty that's good or bad at anything. That's what we're taught. Now, I've never worked side by side with a vascular surgeon. And so I don't have any opinion on it at all. But I see the worlds just together. And I think there is not an interventional radiologist who knows how to do an interectomy. No interventional radiologist knows how to wield a scalpel and like cut open aorta and sew it. So there is a heck of a lot that we don't know. And I have loved learning about approach. And Jill's taught me a ton of that because she's worked at these different labs. So I look at that. I really think the answer is combined forces. This is going to be so unfavorable and get me in so much trouble. But I think every IR needs to be working with a vascular surgeon because the open, I like the open stuff for a lot. And I send I feel like a lot of patients to our vascular surgeons because I think there is a really good role for open. And I love having the ability to bounce cases off of vascular surgery. And I've never had it before, ever, before like Twitter and Jill. And now knowing you and knowing developing a relationship with our hospital vascular surgeons, people I trust, that are like good doctors where it's not going to be a referral, a political, a this, a that, where it's just like, let's talk about the patient and what would you do here? And if you said, if I sent a patient to you and you said I would do endovascular, okay, well, then I'll do the endovascular. But if you said I would do surgery, I would send with surgery. So we benefit immensely by having great vascular surgeons such as yourself who have both endovascular and open experience. I personally am worried about vascular surgeons not being great open people. I've seen that like when I started in fellowship, vascular didn't do the endovascular. So they, so you knew that they came from a very like open, what does this look like in an open surgery world? And so finding out who are the people who are going to give you legitimate answers who know how to do both. Des Tesso is another one of them. So I am really fortunate to know you, Des, um, some of the local guys here who will give me good answers, but you kind of have to know both. And then I want to refer these patients to doctors who I know are going to take care of them and they're not going to just feel like, oh, yeah, they operated on, but he was, you know, bedside manner was terrible. And that's hard to find, you know, like the right person that you can send somebody to who's going to take care of them. Like I would have a patient get on an airplane and go see you for sure, because I know that you're going to make the best decision for the patient, even though everybody always says that because that's a great tagline and also be nice and treat them well and be kind to them and. And that's hard to find all of that. Yeah, taking a, just a, a little step back of what this platform, and again, let, I mean, it just happens to be Twitter in this case, but with what this platform means for us, the human being in its essence is, is tribalistic. We tend to see people that think and act like us. And for many, many years, we have been bound by geographical existence, right? I mean, if you're born in the Midwest and you're probably growing up to be a Midwest mentality and you have to ad adhere to whatever that means. If, if you're born in Latin America, then you're going to grow up to be that person. But here you come and you propel now into the current state of affairs where globalization and the ultimate penetration of the internet has now has generations of people that in many ways actually feel out of place very fast and not making it into this huge debate about identity. But a lot of us would have loved to have found each other 20 years ago. It is, it is surprising that it took a social media platform, 
or, or not surprising, but just amazing. And the understanding that there are these people in Australia looking at the same thing, that there were these guys in Italy who love CLI the same way, love wine, that there were these people in Brazil and these people in North America. And all of a sudden, you, you start seeing the coalition of these people. And it's not like we're groupies and just rooting for each other because we can be pretty ruthless when we don't agree with what you're posting or we don't agree with maybe a management. But the debate is incredibly reasonable. We post the questions and when we're ignorant about something, I don't feel any shame. I don't feel shame by not knowing about maybe some embolization techniques that IR can do and perform way better than me, or maybe a phenomenal transhepatic accident that I would never be able to do. But I've learned so much from that. I've learned and so much also on CTO crossing techniques from cardiologists. And anyway, I could just go on and on about just multi-specialties, but it's that culture of understanding, trying to help us through because what we do, we're fighting a pretty damn difficult disease. We're taking the worst, right? I mean, longstanding diabetes, renal failure, highly diseased patients where results are not as expected always. And you do this day in and day out without a support network. It could be exhausting. And it's just for me, it's been Wow, I found all these people in the world that think like me, that act like me, that are good hearted people, that are willing to teach, to share, to collaborate. And it's allowed me to go around the world and learn. I mean, right now, all this arterialization thing, I went to Mexico, Peru, and then to Italy about to learn how it, how did I know about that through Twitter? I learned through people doing and sharing and telling that they were doing things and it made me take the plunge and go and learn from them. So it's just been great. And it just grows, right? And, and this is just a very succinct example. The other day, I've been going to South Mexico multiple times for the last three years. And I just operate on patients. We bring donated material, try to get sponsors to, to, to do some research and, and pay for procedures and people that would never, ever get. There's waiting lists for major amputation, meaning the patients are at home because there's not enough ORs or surgeons to cut their legs. That's how bad it is. And we go and we're able to do that. And I just made a very nice post on the way back on the plane about how good the time that I was there, seeing what we've built. And I get a direct text message from a doctor in Uganda who is right now trying to do the same. And it's a podiatric surgeon, probably in his 30s, incredibly charismatic, willing. We've already gotten on a phone call and he's, learning what we've done and how and what materials we've exported of off-brand and novascular procedures. And all of a sudden I thought, I should do more of this. Sometimes the stuff that we think is not that important will touch somebody in Uganda. And the fact that this person can change hundreds of thousands of lives through his career, make that post, which anybody else could have said, what a dumb post. Well, you know what? You're dumb because now I get to help this guy in Uganda who is going to help thousands of people and that makes my dumb post so worth it because we found <laughs> another tribe member yeah. and now we have a tribe member in Uganda. So you're dumb and you're out of the tribe. But this is really amazing. It's a social construct that's just created a really, really just beautiful platform. And it keeps just sewing in and attaching people around the world. But I, I mean, I can't say enough of how cool it's been. That is a little love sprinkles right there. I think that's why we have an impatience for the like American healthcare system as it is today, because we see all this stuff and certainly Miguel way more than I do, but I am incredibly grateful for the network because I work alone in an OBL. I got nobody, nobody but me and you, Jill. It's just the two of us. With the work, Miguel, you both of you guys are doing internationally, that's, it's so exciting. And I feel very grateful that there is this network because these are like my homies and I get to be like at least part of this and have access to these guys, Lorenzo and Mike Watts, you know, all these, Mike Cummy, like all these people who are out there doing this great stuff that day by day, and this, this is very different for Backtable listeners, it's going to be extremely different than people who are in academic practices. They don't understand what it's like to be working all alone in an OBL. 
and how important this network is. It's like being the one, it's like a one room schoolhouse and you're the high schooler and everybody else is under the age five or vice versa. You're the two year old and everybody else is in like senior in high school, you know, and you're just an outlier. And the only thing that you have is the ability to connect with other people who care about this stuff as much as you do. I think that that's so I want to talk about what I think people need to put into their practices. This past week, I went to a vascular surgery meeting and it always strikes me. It was a group of doctors who work for an HMO. It always strikes me how different our lives are, like things that I have to worry about every single day. These guys have no no idea even exist. RVU, CPT codes, IC9 codes, access to care, pre-authorizations, the whole business part of it. When I hear this, I realize how different all of our lives are and what our pain points are. I feel for people in academics who have the academic challenges, the OBL people who have the OBL challenges. So all of that is a personal decision. It's where you want to plop yourself for your career. It shouldn't slow down medicine. Everybody needs to be performing the best that they can right now, which means we all need to be pushing ahead in the things we can do, which is access, taking time with patients, and great ultrasound, since this is an ultrasound podcast. And I am just tired of any excuse of why people are not using ultrasound more than they should be using. And I don't feel the problem is going to go away in the next 10 years or 20 years unless somehow we genetically create multiple mini gels or there's some technology or technique to mimic ultrasound findings. Because I don't, I just do not see how we've been saying for two years. Yeah, you have to train techs because everybody's going to listen to this and say, wait, how do I get a gel? Okay, here's how you get a gel. You get whoever it is that does your ultrasound trained to do PAT or you train yourself to do PAT. And then and you have to have a machine. You have to have your eyeballs looking at the ultrasound. You have to have your hand on the probe on the foot and you have to have the machine to do it. And that's all you need. There's going to be a litany of excuses in between that. Billing, coding. Yes, you're going to have to invest in this stuff. I don't know if it's being part of an OBL. I've invested a shit ton into my own career. This does not seem like a barrier. So that's something that Jill or this podcast can't solve for you. You have to, you have to decide that this is something you're going to want to do. And then you just have to make it happen at all costs. It's very easy. You need a tech. You need a brain and you need a hand and you need a machine and a foot. Five things. <laughs> you don't even need a sterile environment. And you also need a no whining. You just have to get it done. Now, if your administration won't support it, then you can't do it. You can push and push and push. And it's going to take between one and like four years to have ultrasound up to what you want. So here's my answer to that. The doctors need to get their hands on the probe and just start looking. Just start doing it yourself. That's what happens. I mean, to Miguel's point, this is what's happening in other countries. And I love the international community because they're not, it's a no excuses type community. So Mary, I, I God, I love your point. And going back to Twitter, you're absolutely right. I think if we can't bring the tech or invest the time, it's the physician. So Miguel, I just posted something on Twitter last week and a physician from Kenya messaged me, private message on Twitter. And that same day, we were on a Zoom link, and I'm going to teach him because the amputation rate in Kenya is so high, I want to make a difference. And these physicians around the world, El Salvador, Fernando Aragoan, he is doing some incredible work in El Salvador. Our colleagues in Australia, Pita Tian, I mean, my gosh, Manar Kastram, I mean, these people across the world are embracing this advanced technique. And I, I think it's really exciting because it's exciting to see the world embrace the changes. I think in regards to the U.S., you know, we're just we still rely on PVRs or ABIs or segmental pressures, but we're going to be behind because we're not going to keep up with the group that is just grabbing the ultrasound transducer and putting it on because because there's a desperate need. We're, we're U.S. is going to be so behind and we're going to be talking about this four years from now about how to start a program and the rest of the world's going to be already doing it. Yeah. And I think a lot of people waiting for more data. I will say that we've concluded our multi-center international study, and I think we're going to have some exciting results for 2023. So maybe that will push. Yeah. Miguel, what are your thoughts? I was just about to say, I think you guys are being a little myopic in minimizing this necessity to embrace and understand and integrate ultrasound in the continuum of care to PAT, 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 because I understand how you guys are just these 
massive fans of this pedal acceleration. What I'm saying why I think it's myopic is because PT is just a small component of what you have shown us in the management of these patients. When we're talking about advanced ultrasound, comprehensive, multi-level, anatomy-driven, detailed and collateral pathways, pedal arterial anatomy, distal target for revascularization, single vessel line line, or what what did you call it the other day that we're going to call it? We're going to make that term famous. Sucker artery. The sucker artery, pedal venous anatomy, calcification, scores of the pedal vessels, pedal venous anatomy, because you can potentially do arterialization, analysis of the greater saphenous vein ahead of any procedure. Now in the setting of the best CLI data, being ever so more important for somebody like Mary that's in an island in, of care with no other vascular surgeon colleague. Well, you know what? It'd be great for her to know that this patient has a phenomenal greater saphenous vein because when she goes into that procedure and there's this 60 centimeter occlusion before she's in the OBL trying to get this thing up, up and open with 32 different venous, I mean, arterial accesses, she may be like, you know what, I'm going to send this patient for a bypass. That's where I think we're missing. And then on top of that, for those that don't feel like they can use it, bring it in the OR and understand the value of access, of multi-site access, on-table analysis. Don't ever talk to me about a, oh, this is a flow-limiting dissection on angiogram. Come on. There's no <laughs> hemodynamics on angiogram. You're just looking and interpreted in an image. Put the damn ultrasound on the artery. Give me Cheers. peaks of stock velocity. Show me how there's some blunted waveforms. And then I'll be like, oh, this is hemodynamically significant. So I may want to advance care. Again, not critical, just saying don't be myopic and saying it's PAT. No, no, it's all these other things. Wait, we're not myoptic. I just am trying to be nicer to the audience. If you want me to really go down the list of the ways that we can use ultrasound, that is a very lengthy, but we would be here for another hour. So... Yeah, I got no myopia about me. And I'll tell you, but you know what? It's funny enough, I think, and here's, okay, I don't know. I really believe that it's the imaging companies themselves that have torpedoed the evolution and the adoption of ultrasound. When you look at how many years there were from the first ultrasound where you'd have to skinny dip in a tub to get waveforms across to show a particular part of your body, to the moment where we have handheld ultrasounds that are phenomenal, that's when CT scan starts coming into the picture, MR scans come, come into the picture, and the end of story and evolution of ultrasound. Shame on you, Siemens. Shame on you, Philips, and everybody out there because there has been zero evolution on the technology of ultrasound. Until now that you have spoke spokespeople like Jill that are putting their foot down and say, no, no, there's so much more that needs to be added. And there's so much more that the patient can get. Well, but it's not compensated the same thing. Some physicians say they don't trust techs. It doesn't pay the same. There's all these excuses for a technique that's game-changing when you understand how to use it, when to add it pre, trans, and post-operatively. So we have to continue talking about this. We have to continue venting it. And we have to continue fighting with the companies that own this technology for them to consider going back and giving us better versions of these ultrasounds, more handheld, more intuitive, artificial intelligence. There's so much that they can add to it that is going to help with adoption. They have a huge part of responsibility in tanking the evolution of the, of the technology. Yeah. Cheers to that. You know, I was going to ask to conclude this podcast because it's an ultrasound podcast. What is, you know, if you could look into a crystal ball, what would be, you know, your thoughts of what the future would look like? But you might have just said it, Miguel. I think that the advancement of ultrasound could be huge. But what does that look like in five years? If we had this conversation over a glass of wine, you know, what does this look like for us in the future? Wait, we weren't supposed to be having wine while we we're doing this? Well, we're drinking martinis. Oh, okay. <laughs> dirty, dirty martini. Okay, I'm glad we figured that part out. I'm in the process of setting the Hope, you know, Clinical Innovation Center. And you would think that the hardest piece of the material and the technology to, that I've been acquired was, was a CRM because it's, you know, more expensive. That was the easiest piece. My fight 
is to get good ultrasound machines because they keep sending me these portable laptops as if all I want to do is somehow see some gray rain that's going to give me some. And I keep sending these back to every vendor and trying to explain to them, no, I want the top line. And they're like, no, we gave you the top line CRM. I understand. But as important as a CRM is the ultrasound. Giving me a great CRM and a shitty ultrasound is like giving me a Ferrari with an Uber driver. It's just that you need to put two and two together and you need to understand that these technologies are so complementary and that are going to change the practice and the care in the lives of so many people. We have a duty to talk about this. We have a duty to ventilate it through things and efforts like this. Kudos to you, Jill, and kudos to Backtable. But we also have to go and bitch with the industry leaders and push them that we need more. The same way they progress on echo and transesophageal echo and all this. Go back to peripheral echocardia, ultrasonography, and give us better devices, handheld devices, wireless devices, integration of software, artificial intelligence, pop reports in seconds, because that's where we're wasting the human component of a tech. I don't care. The report needs to cross. There, there have to be certain items that need to go through and you need to be able to bill for that. Perfect. Let that be automized. It's the human part of this that we need to have in the center of everything. We need those people and those technologists. That human resource needs to be acquired, needs to be grown, and we need to also give them better technology so that they're not fighting their way through uh, advancement of care. Totally agree. Mary, if you could look into your crystal ball in five years, where are we going to be? Where would you like to see us? And she's referring to the ultrasound thing. Don't, don't Right. Retired on an island. It's not everybody in a nudist island in 10 years. No, <laughs> yeah, that's not it. OK, that's a funny thing. So Jill actually has some funny. Oh, boy. Jill has some funny comments. Yes. Jill and I always laugh about what doctor coping mechanisms that actually she started because she works with so many different doctors like so intimately. You know, she's somebody who's really side by side. She's the only person I know who works like really side by side, like very like co-piloting, you know, throughout the day. And I have my own coping mechanisms, which will not be exposed on a Rated G podcast. But Jill's talked about the different coping mechanisms that people have. One day she's like, oh, yeah, and we won't say their names, but she's like, Dr. X surfing videos, Dr. Y buys things on Amazon. Doctor, you know, what are the other ones? She listed off all the doctors. Plays a video game. <laughs> a video game. Mine are actually not rated G. They're not not work appropriate. But I also am always like complaining because if people come in, I'm on my phone and I'm just sort of, I'm coping, I guess. I never really realized it was a coping mechanism. I'm just doing my thing. And Jill's like, coping mechanism. It's okay. You all have them. Yeah, we have to have our coping mechanisms in medicine or else, you know, we would not be alive. But where I would like the world to be, I think there should be, okay, so Miguel doesn't have like a hissy fit, some sort of way to look at foot perfusion that may or may not be PAT, that may be thermal imaging. We need to focus on the foot because that's what matters is the foot being perfused. Like nobody cares about a carotid artery being occluded if patient's not having a stroke. You can have a dissected carotid artery that you like sit there. I've got a friend who had it during pregnancy. She's got occluded carotid arteries and she's doing fine and nobody seems to care. Why do we care about an occluded femoral artery if the foot perfusion is normal? So I'd like to see foot perfusion leading medical decision making. I think that given the way our healthcare system is moving, we're not going to be able to train, create, and provide people to that. So it's the answer is going to have to be in medical devices in some other way. Reimbursements are going down. People are more expensive. Doctors are quitting. Techs are quitting. It's hard to find techs right now. And I don't think that that's going to magically change six months from now. So we are going to have to figure out how to get this information without human bodies being involved. I don't know. I mean, reimbursements are going down. I get this random letter from an unnamed company that is two words. That first word starts with a city on the East Coast where SAR just had its latest meeting. And I was advised that, oh, sorry, it's a new year. All of your product is going to be more expensive. And that's all you get. So looking at new devices and trying to figure out, we're being squeezed in every direction. And if that continues, we'll be squeezed out of it. 
and we're going to, I'm going to hold on as long as I can. So we're going to have to fix that aspect of it because then we'll have the dream, which is we get to know about foot perfusion. We get to act on foot perfusion with objective criteria and we can get back to practicing medicine and not having to deal with all the noise around it. It'll probably never happen, but that's, that's my wish list. That may not be the, my like prediction. And I love, I think we need to keep on cross-pollinating. We need to be in a multidisciplinary. Like I think these differentiations of IR, IC, VS, that needs to just drop away. And it is. I don't feel that anymore. I got Miguel and you and all the friends. Yeah, one thing is where I want it to be. One, another one is where it could go, right? I think if a number of enthusiastic people get on the same page, again, let's go back to the, if we go on to the tribe and we find enough people in the tribe that are willing to share data, to share outcomes, to be vulnerable, to step up, to discuss, and to have enough traction with Medicare to build a sensical, reasonable, because it's really hard to go all in on the most complex subgroup of patients and take on all the risk. But you have partial risk models. If we have a group of us that are trying to find that, I think that is the way out of a lot of the negative things that Mary is pointing out. I think it's the way out if we can step back from fee for service and give ourselves quality of life with sustainable wealth and adequate patient care, good classification, good non-invasives that help drive objective decisions on the front end, and technology that can be adapted to the continuum of care for peripheral artificial intelligence, remote sensing platforms. I think that we can be looking at what the goal should be, because that also is not only the key for America, but the key for the world. Right now in Mexico, we are in the process of developing this sort of entities where they're very low cost with very limited resources, using it on the right people and making sure that we get the right results and that we can maintain those people in remission through technical aids, good medical care, nutrition, lifestyle, and have a way of seeing them peripherally so that they continue to be in remission. I think that's the sustainable global way to go about this problem. This is the true pandemic. And we can't hide in our houses from it. We have to just go out, gun blazing, and try to fix it. And, you know, I'm very honored that I'm just one little grain of salt. But I, when I talk to people like you, I get very, very excited that there's more sand and, and more grains. And together we can become a tsunami for change. And so I don't know if that's my wish list or, or what I'm seeing in the, in the future, but I think it could be done. Jill, how are you going to solve the ultrasound tech crisis? Uh, with you two. I think it's going to take our tribe. I think it's going to take a way, a platform to train and disseminate the information. But it also takes, you know, there's a lot of fantastic techs out there with the drive and the want and the motivation to do more. And I think um, we just have to provide the venue. And right now, you know, with SVU and other, you know, AVLS, there's some great meetings, but they're only once a year. So we've got to do something to create a more sustainable model that's hands-on, face-to-face, that's, you know, we need to train these techs and, you know, let them see the cath lab, let them put the whole picture together. I think there's a huge missing component that, that they were never taught about. So I could go on and on, but I think the future is bright. I think that between hope and advanced vascular, I feel like we get all of our tribe together and come up with some model to really move the needle for advanced vascular ultrasound. Before you, you go on to, to wrap us up, I'd just like to say that, you know, maybe we can start a trend because I, I do feel a lot of people are either overly treated or under treated. And if only they got a thorough ultrasound scan and a good team of people looking at it, we could figure out who doesn't need it and who definitely needs it. And 100%. so we have these ongoing discussions. I don't think I can tell you numerous amount of times where I've been on panels and it's like endo first approach versus open first approach. And we've gotten all the way out to then creating randomized control studies. Here's one. How about ultrasound first approach? Yes. And then we can decide because ultrasound first approach is going to let you know if you should do open or endo. 
Boom. We should also talk about the quality of the report. And I said this thing on the first time, this like garbage report that's like a list of numbers tells me nothing. I literally just can... Basura. Trash, exactly. I was going to say burn it. I was going to say put a lighter to it. Basura. It's not even worth the click of opening the box to read the stupid numbers. It's about as valuable to me as knowing the patient's hair color. So if you're going to do an ultrasound report, like it needs to have a diagram that demonstrates the calcified cap, demonstrates the access demonstrates the quality of the atherosclerotic disease, demonstrates the foot perfusion. And the crazy part is it actually makes your job so much easier because you know what to do. Quality of the saphenous vein. Yep, exactly. We've talked about exactly saphenous vein mapping. It should be because it means you're also thinking about what are the options for this person? You're putting the whole picture together in one ultrasound that's 45 minutes or less. And you're telling me that's like, what replaces that? Nothing. Not CT, nothing. Not physical exam, nothing. And it means you're looking at all options. And then you can text your friendly surgeon, you know, on the beaches of Costa Rica where Miguel sends to spend his life. Houston. Oh, yeah. Every time I text you, you're on some nice beach and I'm like slugging around here in this rainy gray Portland. I'm doing the American thing. Uh, My wife said I had to take her on a baby moon, whatever that means. But it was great. (laughs) Any excuse to go to Costa Rica, I'll take it. (laughs) Anyway, hashtag ultrasound Ultrasound first. first. Well, thank you both so much, truly, for being amazing friends and incredible physicians and really having the the passion. And oh, my gosh, I just am so thankful for both of you. Thank you for taking the time to be on this podcast. I hope someday that we will all be scrubbed in together on a case and that will be fun. We probably won't even need to say a word. We can just look at each other and know what's happening. So that'll be... I want Miguel to show me an interarterectomy so badly. I want a slice of common femoral artery open and peel out that plaque so badly. I can't even sleep at night. I think about it over and over of like just slicing that thing open and watching that stuff peel out. I saw it on somebody's like YouTube or Twitter video or something. It's just like cannot stop thinking about it. So one day, one day, Jill, we're going to fly to Miguel and he's going to do that. And it's going to be a moment. Just to clarify something, when we are going to gain access, I will definitely turn the probe around for both of you because. Oh, boy. Because you do it backwards. I think I think we settled it. <laughs> the Miguel and we're Mary two way. We're 2v1. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm always like, where's the needle? Where's the needle? Oh, wait, Jill. And then she flips it. God, I love you, Jill. You're so smart. I love you too, Jill. You're like the brightest point of the entire day, every single day that we work together. All right. Here's where you have to wrap it up and say goodbye, everybody, because everybody right now is just laughing at us and there's no seriousness. All right. All right. Thank you both so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 